Good evening. My name is Dr. Malcolm Punter. I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement. I'm the moderator tonight, and I'm uh, joined by our co-moderator, Dr. Joan O. Dawson, the chairperson of the Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement. Good evening, and I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, HCCI and New York University Langone Medical Center is co-sponsoring the COVID-19 Facts versus Myths presentation. Tonight, you will learn about the most current information about COVID-19 and the effort that is a nationwide effort and essentially a worldwide effort to find a solution in the form of a vaccine as well as other therapeutic methods to cure this country and this world of the pandemic of the COVID-19. Uh, we have a, a, a esteemed panel of medical experts, research scientists, educators, clergy, representative from our, our, our political community here tonight to make sure the community of Harlem and the Bronx and New York City has the most current and up-to-date information that is factual as well as useful for your lives today. My co-moderator, as I mentioned, is Dr. Joan Dawson. Dr. Joan Dawson actually is an alumna of New York University. She was a professor uh, at New York NYU for uh, over 20 years and has joined us today to uh, co-moderate this panel with me. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Dawson to you this evening. Dr. Dawson? Please unmute yourself, Dr. Dawson. Greetings. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate the support that you give to HCCI and the tremendous efforts that you go through to continue to affect our community in outstanding ways. Our goal here tonight is to arm you with enough information so that you are able to guide your families, your friends, your neighbors, and your constituents effectively. As a, I'm gonna, I, before I do that, before we start the program, I want to take the opportunity to introduce a person who is very special to our community, who has been a friend of ACCI and of the community for many years, and who is a, 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 friend, a personal friend of, of mine and for other people in, uh, affiliated with HCCI. As a lifelong resident of the 70th Assembly District, Inez E. Dickens is a tireless fighter for basic civil and human rights, for social justice, for wage equity, for inclusion and for diversity. She is committed to improving the quality of life of everyone in her community, and I do mean everyone. Moreover, for the past 30 years or so, or so, beginning as a student activist at the side of her father, the uh, honorable, her, and who also her mentor, the late Harlem Congress businessman and New York assemblyman, honorable Lloyd E. Dickens, and her uncle, the late assemblyman and state Supreme Court justice, Thomas K. Dickens, Inez has taken a very active role in economic development and supporting small businesses with a focus on minorities and women owned businesses. She has strengthened New York's celebrated village of Harlem and she remains throughout all of those years, even until today, a main focus for us and also for the, for the political and economic empowerment for all not only the minorities in the community, but as the community has become more diverse for all of the residents in the Harlem community. So I'd like us to just give her a, a, a virtual welcome to our Honorable Inez E. Dickens, Assembly Member for the 70th District of the New York State Assembly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawson. And I, I salute uh, you and Dr. Punter from HCCI. Uh, for all that you do, including tonight, and of course, uh, NYU Langone um, Center, Dr. Mulligan, uh, for agreeing to this. 
Um, and of course, Juanita, thank you so much. Uh, I know it's difficult to pull pull us all together, but you you, you did it. Um, tonight, what what you are doing, which is to give the facts versus myths of the vaccine clinical trial. My community and most communities of color are frightened when they hear about this. They're nervous because our culture has had a pandemic of our own, of, of syphilis being injected into us, of being sterilized and not knowing that that was what was happening. So our community remembers that. Grandmothers taught their children and the mothers taught their children. So we've become frightened of, of, of vaccine, particularly when we have just come out, if we're not returning, to a pandemic that we had never before seen. And although our community was heavily impacted with HIV and AIDS, the, the, the truth of the matter is because uh, our community initially looked at it as strictly a sexual disease, strictly an LGBTQ um, N and I disease. Uh, we didn't, uh, we weren't as frightened of it. This pandemic was something totally different. And it was taking out children, uh, uh, young adults, middle aged and older people, it was taking out everybody, no matter what the generation. And so we are frightened. So you have taken on the responsibility, and I thank you for that, of educating not just myself, but everyone that tunes in so that we are armed with the necessary tools to combat that, that battle of fear, of, of, of misunderstandings in order for us to be able to be a part of, of the trials because the black community and the brown community was most highly af in, uh, affected by this. So I wanna just say thank you to all of you and thank you to all the panelists for being uh, agreeing to be a part of this. This is so important because if we're not part of that trial, then you're not gonna get the right information. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Inez. We are always, as I said earlier, we're always grateful to you and for the support that you have given to, to HCCI and to us. Uh, you've always been there for us. You have always been a, a giant in terms of coming through for us when we were in some sort of need. So we want you, we want you and the New York community to know how much we appreciate, the New York University uh, community to know how much you are valued by us. Thank you, Dr. Preston. And I want to just say that I, I went to NYU for my first two years before I went to Howard <laughs> University. You, you and, some, and, you my, some my, and my uncle graduated from NYU and NYU Law School. Mm, wow. well, 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 we're comrades <laughs> in more ways than one. Because I spent a lot of years at New York University and uh, it's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful environment. But we, we, as one of the things that I enjoy being chairperson of HCCI is making these connections and being able to um, unite all sectors of the community to rally around the issues that are critical to uh, and important to us. Uh, since moving into Harlem, uh, I can certainly identify with everything that you've talked about. Uh, I've been up there through the years of the 80s, so I know exactly the impact that various diseases and various plights have had up on the, on the uh, community before it became as diverse as it is now. Tonight, our goal is to provide the facts related to COVID. And in partnership with NYU, as well as civic, religious, and lay leaders, we have all united to bring you our solid information. Uh, bring you some solid information that will help make things clear, not only for you, but for all of us. <clears throat> I'm going to now uh, introduce a leader in the infectious disease research programs. He currently oversees the research that we're, we are now discussing. 
He oversees the clinical operations in the Division of Infectious Diseases and, and Immunology, as well as an established, he has established a new vaccine center at new NYU Langone. Before coming to NYU Langone, Dr. Mulligan held several positions at Emory University, including Associate Division Director for the Clinical and Trans Translational Research in the Division of Infectious Diseases, and he was Executive Director of the HOPE Clinic a clinical arm of the Emory Vaccine Center. In those roles, he focused both on the vaccine clinical trials and on immune systems studied that yield vaccine candidates. Let's take this time to give Dr. Mark Mulligan a very welcome round of applause, also virtual. Dr. Mulligan. Well. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Dr. Punter, and especially thank you, Assemblywoman Dickens, for being here. It's a real pleasure to be on in this very esteemed panel, and I look forward to tonight very, very much. I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. I'm an infectious diseases specialist. Uh, I've, I've been a doctor for, gosh, 36 years, I guess. I do medical research uh, and see patients, and, and most of my research relates to vaccines. So I want to talk about vaccines. I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes, and uh, I hope I'm going to set the stage for um, education and questions, and, and I hope a few answers and reflection about this the situation that we're in. Um, first of all, vaccine is a way to train our immune system, uh, the white blood cells, really. Um, to recognize and fight against a germ like the COVID-19 virus. And the, the parts of the immune system that respond to vaccines and then fight the COVID-19 virus are the antibodies, the B cells, the T cells. And you've heard about many of those. To safely develop protective life-saving vaccines, we, the, the clinical researchers, perform clinical trials. And I've been doing this for 33 years. Uh, now, personally, we do phase one, the very first part where we uh, invite participation from tens of people, phase two, where we have hundreds of participants, and phase three, which is where we are now with many of the COVID-19 vaccines, where we invite thousands of participants. Some of the COVID-19 vaccine trials will have as many as 44 or 60,000 study participants across over 100 sites all over the world. So if you look in your medicine cabinet, all of the medicines there are there because of clinical trials and, and the volunteers who stepped forward to participate in clinical research. I always say that our clinical trials participants are heroes. They are standing in for all of us to help advance medical science. Clinical research participation is entirely voluntary. It's a personal decision. And if someone does enroll they can decide to stop any time. Um, just say that's all and, and it's all over and that's fine. Um, I'm here tonight to learn from you uh, and I hope to inform you about vaccine trials and clinical research. So um, I'll start by just saying what's already been said that uh, this COVID has really impacted minorities, um, but not just minorities, certain other groups um, more than most others, older adults, those with chronic conditions, um, essential workers, racial and ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans, Latinx, and indigenous people. If we're going to develop vaccines against COVID, we need all peoples, all groups to participate in the clinical research, but particularly including those that have been over affected, those who are at the highest risk from the virus. It's absolutely essential to invite their participation, to seek their participation. What do we have right now to fight COVID according to the latest guidance from CDC and our state and city governments? Well, we've got social distancing, six feet, wearing masks, avoiding large gatherings, doing things like this virtually rather than in person. And if we're exposed, we, we get tested and we go into quarantine waiting on the test result. The test is positive, we go into isolation for up to 14 days until we have symptom resolution and would no longer be able to pass the virus to somebody else. 
it's also a good time just to ask uh, while we're in the heat of this pandemic and and i think as as was alluded to by assemblywoman dickens that you know maybe it's starting to pick up again in the city i hate to say it but it's starting to look that way but it's a good time to ask the question is it really essential we probably should avoid things that put us at risk so don't do something if it's not really essential at least for a few more months till we get through this thing uh, so these things work but they're hard to sustain and not everybody can uh, perfectly implement them so uh, that leads me to vaccines I want to say something about the importance of vaccines historically. In 1999, at the turn of the millennium, the end of the last century, the CDC declared that vaccines were the greatest public health advance of the last century. And that's a pretty strong statement. Uh, the greatest public health advance of uh, the, ninth, ninth, the 20th century. Uh, smallpox was eradicated. Uh, polio has now been eliminated everywhere except in uh, for uh, very challenging countries. So vaccines have incredible power and vaccines save the lives of children. Um, they're safe and the diseases kill. Vaccines are safe, the diseases kill. And, and the vaccination program in the US uh, for children that, that uh, all of our children uh, participate in saves 40,000 children's lives every year. It's pretty staggering. There are about 4 million babies born in the U.S. each year. That's our birth cohort. And imagine that 40, without vaccines, 40,000, 1% of them would have died every, every year. Um, so it's an amazing life-giving uh, biomedical tool that we have. So let's turn to COVID vaccines. You know, I think most of us, most um, scientists at least, think that this is the thing we need most to get our lives back to normal. And there's a very large effort underway. The US government, pharma, academic physician scientists like me. And what we want to know about the vaccine, number one, the first question always starting in phase one is are they safe? And then we want to know are they tolerated well? That is, you know, maybe a little bit of a sore arm is a good thing. It tells you your body's reacting. Maybe a little bit of uh, like with a flu shot, you might have a little achiness or feel a little off for a day, but that's not unsafe. That's just an expected, what we call expected reaction to the vaccine. And it, it is probably a good thing. It says your body's reacting to the vaccine. We want that. Uh, but then if we know the vaccine is safe, if we know it's tolerated well, we ask the final question, and this is what happens in phase three. In phase three, we're still collecting safety information. We do that all the way through. But we ask the, the last question, and that is, does the vaccine protect? Will it keep us healthy, protect us from this uh, disease that has killed so many? Over a quarter of a million Americans now have died of COVID. Uh, 7.2 million Americans at least have been infected. The numbers are probably quite a bit higher just because of testing. Normally in the typical flu season, we have anywhere from 12 to 50,000 American uh, deaths. So just think about that. This COVID pandemic here in six months has killed a quarter of a million. Way, way worse than any flu season. I want to talk a little bit about what the clinical trial looks like. So first we start with really what, what I believe we're doing tonight. Community engagement, education, providing information, answering questions, and then inviting participation. And if someone uh, does decide to go forward and participate in the trial, they would come to our research clinic. We have five around the city. Uh, there, and there are multiple other universities that are participating in the, in the vaccine trials. It's, you know, this is a all hands on deck, public health emergency kind of thing. We've got great participation. Um, they would come to our research clinic. They would sign the informed consent document after being fully informed. If, if, if if they wanted to do that, they would get vaccinated, we would collect blood specimens, and they are reimbursed for their time. It's usually $100 for each vaccination visit. There are two of those usually, $75 for the other study visit. There are usually about seven scheduled visits over two years. We also have a weekly touch base where we ask about COVID symptoms. Have you had fever, cough, body ache, lost your taste of senses? 
uh, sense of taste and smell, all the things that we all now well know uh, could well mean COVID. And if that's the case, then uh, there's a testing uh, that is done to see if that study participant has developed COVID. And the way we know at the end of the study if the, if the um, vaccine is protecting or not is that in every trial, in every phase three trial, we have, for example, the one that we're doing now, two out of three people are getting the vaccine. One out of three gets a placebo, a saltwater shot. It's a blinded study. They don't know. We don't know. And after several months <clears throat> with community spread, like we're starting to see again in New York, some people who are in the trial will have become infected. We never deliberately expose people to the virus. We never, you can't catch the virus or COVID from the vaccine. But after several months, once the uh, pre predetermined number of infections uh, has occurred in study participants, the uh, safety board that looks over the trial will look to see, and hopefully what we see is most of the infections were in the placebo group, very few in the vaccine group, which would tell us that the vaccine is providing protection. So that's how we find out in phase three trial if, if protection is occurring or not. So we're now in phase three trials in the US for four different candidate vaccines. There's the Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. We have been participating in Pfizer already and we recently started the AstraZeneca trial. And there'll be others coming soon. And really we need uh, all of them hopefully to be uh, winners, not only safe, and tolerated well, but also provide protection. And all of those vaccines that are in phase three have already been through phase one and two, and we already know uh, that, at least with the numbers of people in those studies, that the vaccine is safe, tolerated well, produces an immune response, those antibodies, T cells, B cells that we think might be protective. And now we go on to phase three with thousands of participants and ask, does it protect? And are we confirming all of the safety information that we have already where we believe those vaccines are safe? Um, I'd like to say something about the speed of the trial. This is something that people have been concerned about. And I want to say unequivocally that no safety corners are being cut. Um, we are following all of the usual safety precautions in doing these trials. Um, I don't get any personal money from uh, the manufacturers of these vaccines. I don't have any personal interest in any one vaccine. I would like all of them to be successful. That's what we'll need to vaccinate hundreds of millions of Americans and over 7 billion citizens of our planet if, if people want to take the vaccine. Uh, we're going to need a lot of uh, different companies' vaccines to be protective and safe. The, uh, the speed comes uh, not from cutting any corners on safety, but rather from three things, I think. One, intense effort. Two, doing some processes in parallel that normally are done in series. And the FDA has approved that, saying it's reasonable for some of the vaccines to do that. And finally, through what's called at-risk manufacturing, the pharmaceutical partners, the companies going ahead and making the vaccine even now making millions of doses before we know, before we have any idea if the vaccine is going to be protective and before we have the full confirmation of safety. That's called manufacturing at risk. So that if at the end of the trial, uh, there, the vaccine is licensed by the FDA, then they can uh, have the vaccine available to start vaccinating. And probably there won't be enough vaccine for everybody at first. There'll be priority groups, just as in the 2009 flu pandemic, those um, who have the highest risk of, of dying would uh, be prioritized to get the initially limited supply. And over several months, uh, there should eventually be enough vaccine for all of us who want to take it. Um, so uh, who participates or who would we like to participate? Well, for the phase three trial, where the real question is, the vaccine protect, we need to be enrolling people that have risk of uh, disease from COVID-19, of getting infected and developing uh, COVID-19. And we know that older adults, those with chronic medical conditions, essential workers that have to go out and get exposed because that's what their job takes. They can't just hunker down at home and do, do uh, video conferencing all day. And then uh, uh, really, I think in part, what we're here to talk about tonight, racial and ethnic minorities, whom we know have 
threefold, fourfold, fivefold higher infection rates and, and uh, higher death rates. But we want all peoples to participate. We need all peoples, but these groups in particular, it's really important that they participate in the trials so that we can show that, yeah, just as for other groups in these most at risk groups, the vaccine is safe, the vaccine protects. So it's really critical to have participation of all groups in the trials now. So I'm gonna wrap up <clears throat> my final couple of comments. <clears throat> so we're in a process, it's, it's, it's already starting. Um, it's a global public health emergency. Clinical trials of vaccines, the early trials have, have been completed and we're into the final phases now. And I think most people are saying that these vaccine trials are the most important medical research projects on the planet right now to try to get us out of this doggone pandemic. They're our best hope for returning to normal as soon as possible if they prove effective and if they improve safe. So we uh, at NYU Langone Vaccine Center and my colleagues at academic institutions around the city who are participating in these important trials are reaching out to communities, to community leaders, like all of you, to inform, provide education, answer questions, learn from you so we can do our job better, and to invite participation. Again, we want all people to participate, and particularly the groups most affected. Uh, it's important to be in the research, those groups most affected, so we know the vaccines work and are safe. Then, when we have the approved licensed vaccine, those communities can have confidence that, hey, we were part of it. You know, we participated and we know uh, that these things work for us and that they're safe for us. We can have confidence. So participation in clinical research is essential to making progress. We need those heroes to step forward as surrogates for all of us to help us uh, get where we wanna be. So I hope that uh, some of you will learn all you can. You'll help educate me and that you'll consider this uh, carefully. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the evening. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dawson and Dr. Connor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mulligan, uh, for that informative presentation. Uh, just for the uh, panelists' benefit and the attendees, uh, the, the remainder of the program will be structured uh, where the, I will introduce the panelists uh, the panelists will ask an initial, one initial question to Dr. Mulligan. Uh, and uh, once the panelists ask that question, we will go into the uh, question and answer phase to the panelists, uh, which will, which will uh, take about 40 minutes. And then the last 40 minutes, we will devote to the attendees on the line uh, that are participating in this uh, Zoom call uh, and the panel, the, the attendees, you're welcome uh, to ask your questions via the chat feature on the Zoom uh, presentation. That chat feature is enabled. Uh, the moderators, Dr. Dawson and I can see those questions. Uh, and once we get to the final 40 minutes of the presentation, we'll begin to ask those questions one by one. And uh, well, I'm happy to say there's, there's hundreds of people on the line uh, so uh, when you submit your question, uh, I will do some, some, I will try to make sure that we uh, collapse the questions uh, into similar questions so that we won't repeat the same question twice. Uh, and, and we'll do everything we can. We'll endeavor to answer all the questions you have in this session. And if we cannot answer all those questions in the session tonight, then we'll uh, make sure that we follow up with you with appropriate answers to your questions that you, that the one, the questions we didn't get to this evening. I hope everybody uh, uh, is, is okay with that and we'll proceed. So the first uh, question goes to uh, the assembly uh, member of the seventh district of Central Harlem, uh, my assembly uh, member, uh, Honorable Inez Dickens, who will pose that question to Dr. Mulligan. Uh, yes, Dr. Mulligan, thank you so much. It was. Um very enlightening what you what you said. Uh, will there and I'm I'm asking questions that have been posed to me in my office. Will there be a cost to those who participate? What do I say to those that I am trying to encourage to participate that this is not 
yet another trial to give African Americans, in this case, COVID-19, in order to be a guinea pig uh, to save uh, other people uh, or, or, or Caucasians, because what, that's what they say to me, um, or the insertion of a tracking device. Okay, thank you very much, Assemblywoman Dickens. First one, there's no cost to participants uh, at all. In fact, uh, we reimburse our participants to try to be sure they don't have to go out of pocket to cover their, you know, their, their taxi fare, uh, lunch for, you know, maybe missing some work. And we reimburse our participants, uh, number one. For number two, in your question, um, you know, I mentioned in my introduction that I've worked for three decades in vaccines. And I spent time, as you heard when I was introduced, both in Alabama and in Georgia, doing HIV vaccine trials. And we were going out into the communities and we got these very questions. So it's, it's amazing um, how similar things are. And I think it's really important. And, and what I have said is, it is true there were great, horrible things that were done in the past by our government, my government, by Caucasians to minorities. And um, we now have a new way of doing things. There's now, now heavy regulation to the um, uh, ethics panels, the IRB, the FDA, none of that was in place way back then. And um, it would be really hard to do something like that now. We're so heavily scrutinized. And um, I think that's the best answer I can give is that yes, these historical things happen. Times have, have changed. I, I'd like to say as well that um, at the highest level of leadership in the, in the NIH, for example, the director of the NIH, they really want uh, minority participation because minorities are most affected. Mm -hmm. So we can be sure the vaccines are safe and work for minorities as well as Caucasians. So it's, it's almost the other way around. And um, in terms of a tracking device, I've heard that one of my doctors in Brooklyn, we have a, a Brooklyn hospital and we'll have a vaccine research clinic there, told me she had heard something about that. And uh, I do think that a, an important part of uh, old-fashioned public health is what they call um, contact tracing. But what that means really is mostly phone calls and public health workers trying to go find, let's say I had COVID, they want to know, well, who all did I, was I around for the last five days? And they try to go and let those people know, hey, you've been exposed to Dr. Mulligan, he's now got COVID, you should get tested and maybe quarantine until you have your test result, make sure you're negative. So you don't give it to your spouse, to your children, to your parents who, who might be at high risk for severe consequences. So thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you. So I, I'll briefly introduce all of the panelists so you know who you are visualizing on the screen. Uh, and I'll ask once I uh, call the panelists, please uh, say hello uh, briefly, introducing uh, yourself to the audience as well as your, your area of expertise. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Gilbert Lewis, who is the Executive Director of the Innovative Resources for Independence, a nonprofit organization uh, based in Brooklyn. Uh, what I know of Dr. Uh, Gilbert is that he is uh, an expert in education and research. Uh, he focuses on autism and, and nonprofit management. Dr. Lewis. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, happy to be here. For the past 20 years, I've been um, teaching research methods and statistics and leading um, organizations that support people with developmental disabilities. And as you can imagine, autism being a very significant challenge um, in the world, um, there are major concerns around vaccines. And um, obviously that started with very poor research practices and very bad publication. And I'm here tonight to really help ensure that indeed every single person of color understand the reason why we should participate in these trials because that's the reason um, Dr. Claude is here to provide us with the kind of information that otherwise we would not be getting in the media for a number of reasons. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, Dr. Scott, Rat Zan, uh, who's a medical doctor and a distinguished lecturer at the City University of New York School of Public Health. Uh, the School of Public Health is one of our co-supporters uh, for this night's, tonight's program. Welcome, uh, Dr. Rat Zan. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Punter. It's a real pleasure to be here. And let me say that the CUNY School of Public Health on 125th Street, which is the Harlem Health Initiative and other pieces embodied, uh, is really pleased to participate in this. I've uh, been a pro pro professor principally focusing on health communication, both at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health and now my principal role at CUNY. And we're working on health communication for social change. And what does that mean? What it means is that we're trying to figure out what are the pulse of people in New York City. And we've been running a tracking survey since the very beginning of this epidemic and then pandemic uh, in New York City, really trying to get the pulse of New Yorkers. And um, it's unfortunate, uh, if we can say what's happened, notwithstanding the, the federal government response and um, you know, clearly what's happened at, at state and other levels. But what is most important is we've been tracking people's interest in taking a vaccine. And we just ran the survey again this last weekend and a thousand New Yorkers, when we asked them, will you get a Corona vaccine once it becomes available? It's down to 55%. But what's more salient, we've been in the 60s to 70s in other polls, is when you break that down. Asian population in New York would say 83% were willing to take it. White, 58%. Latinx, 56%. And African American, 33%. What does this mean? Uh, we believe it's a crisis of trust, it's a crisis of communication, and it's not just clinical trials, although I would like to thank Dr. Mulligan for the piece here and the great work that's done. How do we build not only the clinical trials, but the communication and the trust in the system, not only the, the federal government, the state government, the local governments, and you know, it's really great to have you know, people here of such expertise at all different levels of leadership, because the people we trust are not just doctors, they're, you know, they're clergy, uh, Representative Dickens and others knows the, the people that we bring together for community uh, involvement. So, you know, we're proud to be part of this. You know, thank you for the invitation. The work that we're calling this is vaccine literacy, and it ties in the work uh, that we've had in health literacy for you know, the last decades in the United States. But how do we develop this? And, you know, we look forward to working with all of you uh, and speaking more about this tonight. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, Reverend Dr. Lisa Jenkins, who is the senior pastor of the St. Matthew's Baptist Church in Harlem. Uh, Dr. Jenkins? Yes, thank you so much again for having this and hosting this informative discussion. Uh, I do pastor the St. Matthew's Baptist Church of Harlem, and we serve not only the church community, but the community of Harlem at large. And uh, we also just recently, uh, were, we were a COVID testing center in Harlem. Uh, and one of the things that was really major for us was convincing people to get tested, tested. And now we're talking about having people receive a vaccination uh, that has not been tried yet. And so uh, representing uh, the community, uh, people are not just frightened and nervous uh, as, as uh, our Honorable Inez Dickens mentioned, but they are really uneasy, distrustful, uh, and many do not want anything to do with it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ratson Scott just uh, gave a, 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 some statistics and I did some statistics as well. I took a very formal, informal survey of individuals uh, and what I came up with was when asking uh, how likely are you to participate in a clinical trial, 29.2% said unsure and 70.8% 70 said definitely not. That was everybody. All of these people are African-American that I polled. Uh, then when I asked, how likely are you to receive an approved COVID-19 vaccine after trials? 45.8% said unsure, 25% said definitely not. And the others said probably. Only 16% said yes, after an approved vaccine vaccination uh, was available. And so this is really indicative. And I know it has been said that uh, some of the things that have happened to the black community as far as experimental concern is historical. But even though uh, 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 events or uh, like the Tuskegee Institute was, is historical and, and ended in 1972, we still have to look at what's happening nowadays in, uh, in, in recent times. And the fact that, uh, that people are being asked to take a vaccine or to participate in a clinical trial when as recently as the last couple of years, 
uh, this country could not even provide clean drinking water to a community of black people in Michigan leaves our people pause. It gives us pause to try and figure out, is this really safe? And the answer that most people are saying is no, they do not think it's safe. They do not think it's safe. Uh, Dr. Punter, will I be able to ask a question? Because the people that I polled uh, in this anonymous survey that I did through Facebook and through email, some of them have questions. Will I be able to ask one of those questions at this point? Let me introduce everyone and sure. then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back. Awesome, Thank great. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Dr. Reverend De Jenkins. Uh, Reverend Deacon Rodney Beckford, who's the director of the uh, Joseph P. Kennedy Center here in Central Harlem. He's also a, uh, a, a minister, a deacon at the St. Charles Bar Cap uh, Catholic Church in the Harlem community and also uh, of the Catholic Charities Community Services. Uh, deacon Beckford. Thank you very much, Dr. Punter. Uh, listen, um, what I experience here at uh, Kennedy Center, Kennedy Center has been here for oh, close to 70 years, uh, serving in the Harlem community in a diverse way with a lot of services, uh, particularly senior center every day, particularly those who uh, addiction prevention, case management, uh, particularly our, our pantries feeding those who, who come to our door hungry. And that uh, in, in a great way, as I've mentioned uh, to the panelists before, uh, we, we can get a foot traffic of close to, you know, 8,000 or more a month uh, before the pandemic. Uh, but in that, in that diverse community, along with those who enforce the care and other things that come to our door, along with the basketball, football, and all of those other nice things that happen in the community center, uh, there is a lot of skepticism, as, as you've heard already, and, and these, um, the skepticism comes from that history. And uh, more so, what is more obvious to me and to those uh, uh, of my colleagues who serve here is that uh, folks are greatly uninformed. And, um, you know, you take the skepticism and the being uninformed. I don't want to say ignorant. I don't want to say uneducated. It's just a matter of not having the correct information. And, and here at the center, we um, are known for opening up our doors for information to be disseminated. Uh, so uh, my question uh, would be, what other things uh, are, are lined up? Because we know these things about our communities of color, our Black, Brown, Latinx, and everything else that are not uh, participating and are skeptical, uh, on top of it, <laughs> warranted in, in many ways. Uh, what efforts like what we have here in this uh, workshop, in this seminar, are being made to uh, inform the community that is most affected by the COVID and the community that is uh, also most skeptical and most unlikely uh, to participate in trials? As important as the trials are for people of color, because if we are not in the trials, once you're informed, you know that your side effects aren't taken into consideration when cures are found. So as this is extremely important, and it is extremely important to uh, know what, what efforts are being done specifically, since there is a specific problem. Thank you, uh, Deacon Beckford. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold that question, just as we did with D Dr. Jenkins. And I'll introduce I, I, Dr. Aisha L uh, Langford. I, Dr. Aisha Langford is a professor at uh, uh, NYU Medical School, as well as a researcher, a scientist, and it's my understanding that she's a participant in the trial, Dr. Langford. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, it is correct. I am an assistant professor at NYU School of Medicine in the Department of Population Health. I broadly study health communication and decision making and how to give people the information that they need in a way that they can understand and feel empowered to make good decisions about their health, whether that be to participate in a clinical trial or to take a statin or to get a flu shot or whatever. That's part of what I do. I also co-direct a recruitment and retention unit at um, the universe, uh, New York University. Um, and I am in a phase one clinical trial for uh, a vaccine for COVID. Um, I wanted to participate for a lot of different reasons, uh, partly because I've spent almost a decade studying clinical trial participation among minorities. My dissertation work at the University of Michigan, I actually did an education program about clinical trials 
with black churches in Detroit and Flint and Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it was very interesting because I spent a lot of Sunday afternoons in church basements, a lot of Wednesday nights after Bible study doing these presentations. And I was surprised that although mistrust came up sometimes, a lot of people were saying things like, people never come and talk to us about research. We've never been invited. Um, we keep hearing about all of this medical information and innovation, but my family members and folks on the block are still dying. It's not coming into our communities. And so part of my, I guess, um, commitment is to make sure that people have information, that they are invited, and that when they want to participate and it's a good decision for them in their situation, uh, that they have opportunities to do that because historically we've not always had opportunities just to be at the table and participate when it's a good choice for us. So that's why I'm here tonight and I'm really excited. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Langford. We also have uh, Juanita Erb, who you can see visually on your screen. Uh, Juanita is a member of the NYU team, uh, a, a, a nurse and a, a, a actually a nurse and a researcher. So Juanita, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Juanita Irv. I'm a clinical research nurse and I'm the clinical research operations manager um, at Dr. Mulligan's main clinic. We have five different sites for this particular uh, uh, project that we're going to be working on, um, but I have over a decade of experience working with clinical trials. Um, my first research nursing job was working at Montefiore at the Adolescent AIDS program in the Bronx. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all, uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, and just so the audience know, uh, as the moderator, I have some, uh, you know, certainly living and in, 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 in working in the community, having been born and raised in Harlem, uh, you know, I want to make sure that you get the, the most accurate information. And as the president of the Harlem Congregation for Community Improvement, who is responsible for over 130 buildings in the Harlem community, uh, our organization uh, resurrected many of the uh, blocks in the community. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, we, we've noticed is that when we improve the housing, we also improve the health outcomes of people that live in that house. Uh, on a personal note, you know, I have two close family members who passed away from diseases that uh, had not had a cure. Uh, my grandfather died of, uh, of cancer. Uh, and at the time, I remember we were talking about uh, him enrolling in a clinical trial. In fact, we were begging to get him enrolled in a clinical trial because if, if he didn't get in a clinical trial, we knew for sure that he was going to succumb to cancer. And then my beloved father, who died of Alzheimer's uh, complications, also, you know, we tried to get him into a clinical trial. Uh, and we were knocking on the doors of, of all the institutions to try to get the, the most innovative uh, medicine and therapeutics because we did not want him to die. These are black men who, who, were, who were dedicated parents, dedicated fathers, community workers and activists. And in my opinion, they were gone too soon. Um, but when, 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 the, when, when we had no other hope, we looked to the medical community uh, for some answers. And unfortunately, you know, they didn't have any answers. I would like to have a, a cure for Alzheimer's, perhaps, if someone in my family would also uh, succumb or uh, be afflicted with that disease in the future. And I know you also are looking for honest and, and distinct answers to these, these, these troubling questions during this troubling time. Uh, so uh, Dr. Mulligan is the principal investigator. He's the guy. Nobody on TV, nobody in the media, nobody in politics, is as responsible as Dr. Mulligan because he is the one who is at the head of the trial and he's not hiding behind a cloak of academic privilege. He's here in the community right before you. And ACCI, think of ACCI as a body camera. We're here to show you firsthand, you know, uh, and, and, and speak to you so you can speak to the people who do this uh, every day. These are the experts. And Dr. Mulligan and Dr. Langford and, and Juanita Erb and Dr. Razan and Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Dawson, Dr., uh, Reverend Beckford and, and Inez Dickens and Dr. Lewis would not uh, uh, mislead you uh, because you know, we have to look at you in your eyes. 
every day. Uh, do we say we have all the answers? Absolutely not. A test and a trial is just that. Uh, but we, we, we are here to make sure we can make the most informed decision as possible. So as we, uh, we have a few more questions to pose to uh, Dr. Mulligan from the panelists, and then we're gonna ask the panelists some questions in various categories. And some of your questions will fall in those categories and we hope that they're answered. And as I promised you, the last 40 minutes will be devoted to the attendees on the line and we'll answer your question one by one. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, Dr. Jenkins, you, you had one question for uh, Dr. Mulligan. And yes. uh, any other questions you have, we'll get back to them after everyone else poses theirs. Okay, awesome, great. I'll, I'll, I have one, right, I have a whole bunch of questions actually, but my one question uh, that was asked uh, of the individuals that uh, I posed the survey to is, how soon and how long will the body develop antibodies once vaccinated? And is it in an egg base? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Um, most of the vaccines, let me just think out loud for a minute. Um, most of these vaccines are not produced in an egg base. In fact, none of the ones that are currently in phase three trials are, are produced in eggs. So that's the kind of quick, easy answer to the second question. Um, so the way the vaccines work in general, we're giving two shots. We call the prime and the boost. And within one to two weeks after that second shot, they're usually either three or four weeks apart, uh, Dr. Jenkins, then you have an antibody level. Now, the trick is we don't yet know. Uh, we know a lot about already about how high those antibodies are after the vaccine. And one of the interesting um, research uh, findings is the vaccines are producing antibody levels at least as high, if not higher, than what we call convalescent patients. People whose bodies have successfully fought off the virus and they've survived, if you look in their blood about a month after infection, the vaccines produce that level of antibody at least, and sometimes three, four times higher. And there are now numerous scientific publications showing that. Our own study and our own publication showed that. The thing we don't know yet still is if that's good enough. And that's what the phase three trial tells us. We know that these vaccines appear to be safe in tens and hundreds of people. We know that they produce an antibody of uh, a level of antibody that's higher than uh, uh, what occurs after infection. And now we've got to find out the answer to the critical question. Will that vaccine producing that level of antibody starting about a week after the booster, the second dose, will it uh, protect them? And then another question, of course, would be how long will it last? If it trends down too quick, it could be like, uh, say, a tetanus shot where every few years you might have to get a booster. Um, but these are things for the future that we will have to learn. I always say it's a great time to be humble. There's so much we don't know right now. We're learning more uh, with this, this darn pandemic, this virus, every, every week, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Deacon Beckford, I think uh, you, you had a question. You're next. Yes. Um, uh, like I alluded to before, uh, the information getting out to the community. I, I went to a conference uh, in Alabama, Healthy Churches 2020, Dr. Vanessa Steele, uh, where the uh, health ministries throughout the country, you know, black and brown folks, uh, uh, ministries uh, gathered. And, and, and one of the most prominent things was how uh, our folks don't uh, uh, get involved with the clinical trials and the results of that. You know, so I, I understand the importance of it. I really understand the importance of it because of, unless you have been particularly part of it, sometimes you don't get the information as I alluded to. I got the information because I had a kidney transplant, you know, and my kidney transplant, and when that was happening, Dr. McGonagall, who passed away, he was one of the noted folks on uh, kidney transplants. Thank God my daughter gave me a kidney. I'm a Catholic deacon, by the way, not a priest. Um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, uh, you know, I engaged in being part of a clinical trial, okay? But had it not been for me sitting down there about to have my no good, well, a, a good kidney added from my daughter, I would not have been even inclined and I would have probably had the negative response to it. I was in a situation where it didn't hurt. And, and the end result of that trial was the fact that I actually, what I received in that trial, of course they paid for my, my medication, uh, uh, you know, for quite a while after that, um, 
was that what I had taken was a good thing so you didn't have to take the other medication that was making people sick. Okay, the end result of that trial was what, you know, there was two things. You tried this one, you tried that one. The usual one was the one I didn't try. The one that swallowed you up, that everybody knew it swallowed, swallowed you up. I, I had the other and it works. And I'm still taking the anti-rejection medication for the rest of my life, but it doesn't affect me. So I know the importance of it, but what about the others? How do you, what's going on like this seminar that, that, that professionals, uh, uh, you know, the experts, the doctors like you, how are you getting that information to the community that you know is difficult? You know, how is that happening like this? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deacon Beckford. And it, it's a great to hear your testimonial and your own personal story. Stories can make such a difference. So there's a multi-pronged approach going on. This is a huge national effort. They're getting NBA stars to make commercials uh, that'll start airing soon. Uh, there's a website that's national. Um, we have our own website. We'll be, we have flyers. Um, these are available and we, we share them widely. Um, they can be emailed out uh, to people. Um, we, we do this kind of event. Uh, last night, HCCI had a Spanish language event just like this. Several of our colleagues from the NYU Langone Vaccine Center participated. About two weeks ago, out at one of our, we have five clinics, one of them is out in Mineola at Long Island, the Winthrop Hospital, now NYU uh, Winthrop. They had a, a town hall one night and then they had a Spanish town hall the next night. It's really sort of one by one, I think. Uh, and then we, we have community experts, people like Dr. Langford that um, we talk to and, and uh, try to understand, well, what are the best approaches? What are the things that uh, we need to do to get the word out? We want to inform so that people understand. One other example, the, the national network that we're a part of that's sponsored by US government, the, the NIH, to um, help us get a solution to this problem, to find a vaccine, um, has a, a network of uh, ministers, believe it or not. We've recognized for a long time that one way to inform and to seek and, and become educated is through the churches. I mentioned that I was in Alabama and Georgia, the black churches. And there's a fellow named Reverend Sanders from Tennessee, who's the national chair of this. And he's got a, 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 a minister in each, there's one in New York, in Brooklyn, and I've forgotten his name, unfortunately. They've, they've got uh, seven or eight regional uh, uh, ministers who are um, ambassadors, if you will, soldiers uh, for this cause. And, and so what we, that's part of what we're trying to do as well, is to, to get the foot soldiers, to get those folks that are, willing to be ambassadors that, you know, that feel that this is something they'd like to help spread the, help us spread the word about. And then one of our best, I'll, I'll stop with this, one of our best always uh, methods of identifying and spreading the word are, uh, frankly, people like Dr. Langford, participants who are willing to talk about it and share their story and say, hey, I did it. And here's why I decided, and, you know, maybe you would want to consider it. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mulligan, I have a follow-up question. Uh, uh, this is uh, from Scott Springer, and, and he's the president of the executive board of IRR, and he's asking, will disabled individuals in group homes be prioritized to receive the vaccine once it is deemed safe? How will such individuals like his daughter uh, be monitored for side effects? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Springer. The, um, the prioritization will definitely include those that live in group homes because that's recognized. Think about nursing homes. Um, think about um, homeless shelters. Congregate living settings are clearly, rec even multi-generational families, which we often see in our poor neighborhoods. These are recognized as places where the virus can really spread. And so those will be prioritized so I, I do believe that uh, your daughter, if she's in that setting, would be prioritized to receive the vaccine once it's licensed and available. And then in terms of following for safety, at that point, the, vi the vaccine is licensed. So the study is over. So her follow-up at that point would be getting the vaccine through her doctor, and then her doctor would follow her, you know, just as he would routinely. If she had any kind of possible problem, she would reach out to her doctor. So Dr. Langford, what is the role of someone's primary care physician 
and I know that everybody doesn't have a PCP, but if they do, what is their role in helping them make a decision about any vaccine, but particularly the COVID-19 vaccine? Right, so it, it really depends. I will say just from doing my own research, sometimes even primary care physicians aren't always aware of all the wonderful research opportunities that exist, but I do encourage people um, Sometimes people want to talk to family members. Sometimes people want to talk to their friends. Sometimes people do want to talk to their primary care doctor or a specialist. If, depending on what uh, your health issues are, you might actually be seeing your endocrinologist or you know your rheumatologist more often than you actually see your primary care doctor. So um, if you want your uh, primary care clinician or any other clinician's feedback, I think it's definitely appropriate um, to ask. Uh, some people um, feel like they have enough information to make that decision on their own and they don't necessarily feel like they need to, I guess, ask their doctor. Um, you, in most cases, you don't really necessarily need permission per se. I will say that in many, um, almost all studies in which um, a vaccine candidate or other like tr investigational drug is being administered in a clinical trial context. There's typically always like a physician on the study team. So you can always ask to talk to that person or a research nurse. So um, those are just some ways that you can um, get additional information and input if you like. Um, and I, I will say, I think, I, like I said, I'm in a, a phase one clinical trial. Literally phase one is the first in humans. And I wanted to do that for a variety of reasons. I did not ask any of my doctors. Um, I signed up because I wanted to do it honestly, because for myself, I was hoping like if it works, then I'll be one of the first to get a benefit. But for me, I thought even if it doesn't work, this is one way that I can contribute to my community, my family members that are older that may not be able to participate. This, for me, it was for the team and for the greater good. So I didn't actually consult with any of my physicians before I chose uh, to participate. Now, the screening process is very in depth. And so I had a full medical exam. I mean, literally, there were like a clinician talking to me or examining me literally at every visit I've had so far. And I've had eight. And I think there's going to be 11 total. So you will be in good hands. Thank you. I, would, I would also just want to add a little bit to that. I am considering it. I have not yet uh, started. And I have already alerted my primary care doctor. I did not ask him, but I let him know. And I did that because God forbid uh, something happens and you get sick or you have some sort of reaction, who do you go to? You, you, you might, there are people at NYU, but also your primary care doctor is the doctor who treats you. And I think he or she would be a little bit surprised if you, if something happens and you show up and you've had that and you haven't said anything. The, the, the reaction that I got from my doctor was great. So uh, he was all for it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dawson. Uh, Dr. Rosette, uh, you know, you're an expert in, in the field of, of public health. Uh, you might have a question for Dr. Mulligan, but you know, use this time to say what you think is important uh, to this audience. Well, um, thanks very much. And indeed, I, I sort of posed in my outset to Dr. Mulligan the challenges that we have to attain vaccine literacy. It's not just knowledge of trials, but also knowledge of how vaccines work, why they're important, and why we need them for community protection. Just as we should think about why we have a fire department or police protection or fluoridated water. We need to change the way we think about it as an individual choice to something that's good for the community. That's a whole broad discussion. But the bigger challenge that I think we have is underrepresentation and health equity or health inequity in terms of African Americans or Black Americans being represented in clinical trials. And two other participants in Dr. Dawson's work and others have spoke about Alzheimer's. We know that Blacks are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's, but yet only 5% representation in clinical trials. That's a failure of our system. And the question is to all of us, how do we increase both the equity on the research side and then also on the delivery side? 
we know that the, the first uh, people hopefully will get this vaccine, a vaccine that's safe and effective and trustworthy from a government regulatory system that should be in place and ethical clinical trials such as those at NYU and others that, that have transparency, that have peer review. But who should be the people that get them first? And again, we'll have probably different representation than what the general public uh, is. And it shouldn't just be uh, necessarily people who are first online or the loudest, right? We need to have the appropriate representation and equity too. So my question really to all of us is how do we foster that? We have politicians on the line here, we have clergy leaders, we have community leaders, HCCI has been doing a whole variety of activities, but we need a new way of thinking. And I'm, I'm not happy, uh, if I can say, of the, the government response thus far. We can't rely upon celebrities. Uh, we can't rely upon truth or mistruth or disinformation or misinformation and terms like warp speed, which do nothing but increase a science fiction approach to reality that we face in our communities. So I, I flip it back to all of us. We, we want to do more listening and understand the sentiment. And then how do we work together to approach this? And it's, it's obviously quite complex and something that those of us, as I'm a public health physician, want to work with all of, all of you in a variety of ways. And we know this is not going to be a short fix, but this is a journey just as a clinical trial is a journey uh, and has the appropriate time to, to get science and medical advancements and have the kind of advancement, as Dr. Mulligan well said at the outset, the biggest public health advancement in the 20th century, according to the WHO being vaccines. The second piece, I would say, is education and education of women, uh, particularly in mothers, have also been a big public health advancement. Put those two pieces together, that's how we'll make a difference. And um, you know, I think we can all hopefully do that uh, with events such as these and others. So I'd like to suggest questions around ethical guidelines, informed consent, and uh, what does it mean to have institutional review boards monitoring uh, this clinical trial and others like it. Uh, so let's, let's jump in on uh, institutional review boards. What does that mean, uh, Dr. Mulligan? And how do, they, how do they monitor your work and the work of any other academic and research institution? And who are they? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is an independent board that oversees um, human subject protection, we call it. Uh, they make sure that uh, Tuskegee will never happen again. They watch us closely. They review our work before we do it, make sure that they approve it of it. And then they continue to review it while we do it. We have to provide regular reports back to them. Who are they? They're independent. They have nothing to do with the study. They are physicians. They are clergy. They are lay people. Um, uh, uh, they're not necessarily medical. They're, they're ethicists on the group. In, in Europe and in most of the world, they, this group, the IRB, and the Institutional Review Board, is called the Ethics Committee. And that's really what it is. It's for the ethical conduct of human research. And it's very understandable. There have been abuses in the past, and we need to have this oversight and monitoring. So they initially approve, and then they continue to review and monitor to be sure that we're following our protocols uh, very carefully and that our, our participants are uh, protected against any kind of abuse. So it's a really important part of all clinical research. I cannot do anything so I have the approval of the Institutional Review Board, IRB. Thank you. Uh, 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 Dr. Lewis, I think you have some uh, familiarity with, with uh, research methodology. Um, what is informed consent? And, and, and why is that meaningful? Well, informed consent is very critical. That's what protects the person from participating in something that may, in fact, cause them harm that they did not know may happen to them. And um, the idea of being truly informed so that the consent is a valid consent based on information that you actually understood so that you're giving permission with your eyes wide open. But as Dr. Mulligan was talking about um, effectiveness a little while ago, it occurred to me that I wasn't sure what he meant by predicting effectiveness. So how do you define effectiveness in this particular phase of the yeah. trials? Because at the end of the day, 
that could be defined in many different ways. So what is the hypothesis here? And given what we yeah. see with the flu vaccine, how do we, how, what, what should be our expectations of effectiveness for this particular vaccine? Right. Yeah, the, the level of protection provided by vaccine, uh, Dr. Lewis, does vary. There's a new shingles vaccine and there's the HPV vaccine, 95%, those are incredible. Uh, and then there's the flu shot. And it is good. We all need to take it. I recommend it highly. But it's only, you know, on average, 40, 50%. We wish it was better. That's a big part of what I thought I was going to be doing at NYU before, uh, you know, before first measles and now uh, the coronavirus. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that improved flu vaccine in a few years, I think. But we, we do need that. What the FDA has said, Dr. Lewis, is that we have to have 50% at least. That's the, the floor. If the vaccine is 50% protective or higher, they will, con and of course safe, then they will consider it for approval. If it's less than 50%, they're not gonna approve that. Excellent, thank you. Great. Uh, also, Dr. Mulligan, I, I, I had the privilege uh, because I'm, I'm part of the community advisory board uh, of this group uh, to review the informed consent document. And, and as, I as I was reviewing, I, I realized that this is what any individual who voluntarily joined a trial would receive. Uh, I, was, I, I wasn't happy that I read 26 pages of informed consent, uh, but it was very detailed and it had everything uh, that you can imagine, answered every question that you could probably imagine regarding the procedure, uh, the risk. Uh, could you talk about that particular informed consent form and, and what it should be communicating to a, a prospective volunteer? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Punter. So we, we talk about the form often and what we, the way I think of it and we think of it really is a process that will continue because during the study, things may change, there might be some new information and so we continue to fully inform so that the participant will always have all the information they need to continue in the study if that's what they want to do. And remember I said that participants are free to withdraw from the study anytime if that's their decision. But the initial informed consent document and that process is all about uh, and I liked what I liked how Dr. Lewis said. It said, "Come in. If you make the decision to come in, you're doing it with eyes wide open. You you have listened to the procedures. What what are they going to do to you? How many shots? How much blood? How many visits? Will I be reimbursed for my travel time and my meals? Um, are there side effects that are expected from the vaccine? Are there rare serious side effects? Um, and then it's it's about uh, what uh, this, this being entirely voluntary. It's your choice. You can walk away now or later, anytime. Um, there are phone numbers to the IRB so that if you wanted to talk to the Institutional Review Board, if you had a concern, there's an independent sort of um, ombudsman that you can reach out to anytime. The, the document also has our phone number, my phone number for the clinic, night or day that you can reach out to and, and talk to a doctor. So. It really is, is to make sure you're aware of everything that we would like you to know and that you need to know to make a fully informed decision. And that's a part of uh, showing respect for the person and for allowing them to make their own independent decision. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Duke Jenkins, uh, I know you had some more questions. Yes, thank you so much. Another question that came up was individual asking, will the vaccine be similar to the flu vaccine where you will have to have it updated yearly for its effectiveness? And also, I'm not sure if I'll get another chance to speak, but talking about independent review boards and, and, and other organizations that are working with you, could you please talk a little bit about, I know we discussed it the other day, a little bit about the National Medical Association. Many people may not know that that is the group uh, the Association of Black Doctors in our country, the National Medical Association. And they had said that they were going to closely monitor uh, this whole trial vaccination process. 
So with the question, will it be updated yearly for its effectiveness, like the current flu vaccine? And uh, are you in con conversation uh, with the National Medical Association? If so, to what extent? Yeah, thank you, uh, Reverend Jenkins. So I, I, the first part about um, will there need to be annual updates? We do that for flu because the, the flu is three different viruses. There's flu A, flu B, there's type you know, different types of flu A, and it changes all the time. It's a, it's a highly um, moving target kind of virus. So far, we're not finding that to be the case uh, with this novel coronavirus. So I don't think we're gonna have to have annual updates. But again, I, I wanna be humble and say we're still learning. So, you know, this is thing is less than a year old, so uh, we'll have to learn more. But right now, we don't anticipate that. And then for the second part, yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the NMA, the National Medical Association, the, the Black Physicians Organization. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I'm very aware of the organization, but what I wanted to say was I'm aware that they have stated that they're going to keep a close eye on this thing. And I'll be very honest. I think that's great. I don't blame them one bit. I, I, I'm going to be, I'm keeping a close eye on it too, because of all the um, things that are happening in politics and the, the pressures that we've heard about. You read about it in the New York Times all the time and, and in, you know, many other uh, publications. So uh, I think that's fine and I think it's appropriate. Um, and, and I'll no note that Governor Cuomo has said the same, that the state of New York will do uh, something similar. And then lastly, I may, if uh, Juanita is on, I may ask her to just comment on our engagement with the NMA because I'm very happy to say we have engaged with a representative of the M NMA Juanita, could you comment on that? Yes, hi. Um, my video is starting. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, so we actually, uh, Dr. Langford uh, sent me an email that was authored by the Multicultural Physicians Alliance, um, and it was sent to the FDA in regards to the lack of diversity in uh, coronavirus uh, but treatment and research. And uh, they started this alliance to uh, increase the number of participants who, uh, black and brown participants who are engaged in clinical trials. And we have been in touch with a number of them and <clears throat> they do not live in New York City, but they have consulted us on best practices for engaging with the community. And if, if you don't mind, I'd also like to throw in, so the National Medical Association in kind of the mid 2000s actually had a whole campaign called Project Impact to encourage uh, Black adults and African Americans to think about participation in clinical trials. Um, I actually used some of their materials and their videos for my dissertation research with Black churches. So they've, um, I think, been at the forefront for many, many years. And I think, you know, the Association of Black Doctors, Hispanic Doctors, Native American, like I think every, everyone understands that the research is important. And they're all really committed to just making sure that this scientific process, this step-by-step -step process is very safe and that our communities are not being um, abused in the research, that they're being properly represented. Um, but I think in general, everyone is on board with, we need representation. Um, so I don't think that's anything that we disagree about, um, kind of how we do that and how we make sure that we're protecting the communities that we're advocating for. Um, that's what we're all very mindful of. I'd, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Mulligan a question, please. Um, and I think this might be beneficial to, the, to many people who be, may be considering um, participating. I, I know that you have spoken on the various groups um, who would, would receive treatment first, people who were in, in a certain age group, people who are frontliners, uh, but can you say a little bit about um, the condition of these people? Uh, what are you looking for in terms of what about people with pre-existing conditions? People in various, uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, for example, people who might have Alzheimer's or people, people who may already be dealing, many of our people in, in our communities are already dealing with issues of asthma and issues other types of, of, uh, of ailments. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, where you would draw the line, if there is a line to be drawn, how do, how we, how do you go yeah. about getting, if, if someone is out there considering um, right. coming on board, what do yeah. they need to know? Thank you, Dr. Dawson. I, I think that um, there will be prioritization once the vaccine's improved, no doubt, I'm approved by FDA, no doubt. And that'll be because the supply will be limited. And this was done in 2009 flu pandemic as well, when the initial supply of the vaccine was low. And, and it'll be prioritized to those that have uh, risk of death and risk of severe morbidity, being in the hospital, being on a ventilator. And we've talked about several of these groups, and, and now you're asking, and I'm going to focus on those with chronic conditions, is, is how we refer to it broadly. And within that, it includes things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, um, uh, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, kidney disease, um, people uh, on dialysis. So people with chronic organ system disease, dementia, we talked about Alzheimer's, chronic organ system disease, um, and often those we see, you, you see a lot of chronic disease often say, I'll give you an example. One of our five clinics, I'm very proud to say, is going to be at uh, the Veterans Hospital down on, on First Avenue, right near NYU. So we have there a lot of minorities, a lot of older adults, and a lot of chronic medical conditions. Uh, and that is almost like a perfect storm for COVID. The reason we're calling out these chronic conditions that will be prioritized to be offered and provided the vaccine first is that they have the greatest risk of death and uh, chronic conditions make COVID so much worse. Where will they draw the line? Well, healthy young people, healthy middle-aged people um, who, don't, who aren't frontline workers, you know, who maybe work in an office tower and can work from home and telecommute, those folks are not gonna be uh, prioritized. They'll be the last in line. Uh, this may be a case where, um, you know, in a way, the, the last will be first and the first will be last in terms of socioeconomic. And, and that's going to be stuck to. Right now in our clinical trials, I'm having to say no for our phase three trials to an awful lot of folks who would like to be in, but they don't qualify because we must focus on those with all of these risk factors we've been talking about. It's our, it's our moral obligation. It's what I know is the right thing to do in the trials. And then I think when the supply is limited after approval, that's how they'll be distributed as well. Who will decide who will make that list? Usually it's the CDC, someone like that, a government panel of, you know, of, of scientists, public health experts like Dr. Ratzen and, 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 and others. Thank you. Uh, could we just have the panelists summarize uh, what, what, what they think is most important for the community to hear. Uh, and uh, we have 10 minutes, we're almost 10 minutes to eight, uh, because right at eight o'clock, I'm gonna uh, strip, switch to the, all the attendees. And we have over a hundred attendees on the line. Uh, so could you just give your uh, closing statement, which is not a closing statement, but a summarization at this yeah. point? Let's start with uh, Deacon Beckford. Well, uh, and, and, look, and looking at what I would think that is one of the most critical things that, that we can do, uh, clergy, elected officials, you know, uh, medical uh, experts and everything else, I think what we need to do particularly is to um, be that credible messenger, okay? Because I, I, I just like in, in looking at violence and all the other things, if the messenger who's delivering uh, uh, the information is incredible. Uh, <laughs> no one's going to follow through and pay it any attention. So, so clergy leaders are, are credible messengers who, who lead flocks. You know, those who are CEOs of organizations, they 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 they, they command that respect from from their position uh, of not of being responsible for for people and their lives and everything else. Uh, elected officials, of course. You know, Inez and, and all of our, our wonderful elected officials in our community, particularly uh, when when they speak, people listen uh, and, and take to heart, and they question them too, so they can get an answer. You know, so I, I think that would be what uh, is what I would like to make sure that we do. Uh, those who have any authority in any position, uh, 
is, is to be that credible messenger and be available to impart that information and be knowledgeable about what they talk about. That's pretty much what I would have to Thank look you. for and understand. Thank you, uh, Deacon Beckford. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, uh, one of our elected judges who's on the line, and I won't out everybody, <laughs> but I did want to make sure she's acknowledged. This is J. Michelle Sweeting, who is a uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, in New York City and a community member, a lifelong community member. So uh, if you want to make some remarks, we're certainly happy to have you at this time. Well, thank you, Dr. Punter. I just wanted to commend the panelists, your expert panels. You need not a word from me except to say thank you for all that you're doing to ensure the integrity of these, this process and this important pandemic. So thank you. I want to yield all of the time to the experts who you've assembled. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Judge Sweeting. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lewis. Well, it seems to me that we have an obligation to vote, but we also have an obligation to participate in this because we can't be complaining if we are not part of the solution. And in this case, being part of the solution means participating in these trials. At the end of the day, we owe it to our community, we owe it to ourselves, and more importantly, I want to thank NYU Langone and HEI for having this session for inviting me. Thank you so much and hope we all get to participate when we have a safe and effective vaccine and hopefully um, there'll be plenty for everyone. Well, stay with us because we, we still have community questions. Uh, uh, silly, uh, Member Dickens, a summary? Uh, I, think, I think her video is stuck. So we'll go on to uh, Dr. Ratzan summarizing what we've heard today so far? Well, well thank you. I, there, there are a lot of fundamental questions and Dr. Mulligan did a great job of explaining both the process and the challenges of clinical trials. And, and those of you here, uh, Dr. Langford, I'm being a participant, is terrific. Uh, Deacon, uh, really uh, respect the idea of how we can become this trusted source and how we build the messengers and then get with the community. And I say we, um, I'm only one member, it's, this is us, and it's all of you. And, I'm most concerned with the statistic I said at the outset. We just measured a thousand New Yorkers. Would they take a vaccine if it was proven safe and effective? Would they get it for themselves? We asked other times, would they get it for their kids? Right now, only 33% of African Americans in New York City say they would take a vaccine. There's a lot of upside challenges. The hill is getting steeper from the communication that we get, the trust issues that dated back that Dr. Dawson said at the outset to unfortunate historical events that have happened in this country. If the vaccine is too quick and we don't do the groundwork, we're going to lose against this microbe. And I can't say that strong enough or I'm involved with something that we call CONVINCE, which stands for a COVID new vaccine information, communication and education. And putting that acronym and putting that together requires all of us. And we're working with the business community. We're working with global community and other experts. I hope that we are able to do that also local, not only the Harlem community with HCCI, but really all the communities that we all have great networks. And I want to thank you know, NYU and the, the, uh, this, all of you today for inviting us to participate in this important activity. Thank you, Dr. Ratzad. Uh, Dr. Langford? Yes, go ahead. When Dr. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Okay, and uh, thank you, Dr. Red said I look forward to hearing more about your Convince uh, network and happy to help however I can. Um, I just kind of tangentially, uh, this month is uh, Health Literacy Month, and I think we've talked several times about getting good information to the community. Um, not all of us are going to be doctors or go to med school or nursing school. I'm not getting any more degrees. But when my family members or friends have questions, um, one of the places I like to share is medlineplus.gov that has information about clinical trials and general health information. Um, a lot of folks that are brown and black, and actually, frankly, many people who live in the US who are white as well, don't really think about science and clinical trials on an everyday basis. So clinicaltrials.gov is another way to find out about COVID-19 vaccine, 
opportunities uh, for trials, but also trials all the way from diabetes to caregiving support. So there's lots of opportunities there. And then lastly, I just wanted to share that um, the coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org also has specific information about studies like Dr. Mulligan mentioned that NYU is participating in, but it's also listing sites across the country that are participating in various COVID-19 vaccines. So if you have a family member friend in Chicago or Oakland or Texas who's interested, you can put in your zip code and find um, locations near you. So I think part of being trusted professionals and trusted family members and friends is that we're sharing good information and not, you know, crazy people on YouTube or like Facebook that are spreading lies. And these are good places. So just to be mindful of what we're sharing and spreading. So that's Thank all. You, Dr. Langford. Dr. Jenkins, uh, Reverend Jenkins, summary? Yes. And then we'll, and then we'll take your series of questions from you first. Actually, before we do that, I do want, want I wanted to thank all of the panel uh, panelists who have participated. You've done a great job, um, Dr. Langford, uh, Dr. Jenkins, our Honorable Inez Dickens, Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Bedford, or, and of course our uh, Dr. Mulligan, our special guest, uh, Juanita Ebb and uh, Dr. Ratson. And uh, thank you, Michelle, for coming on. Uh, we've all, I, I think it's, it's outstanding, and I just wanted to take a minute to thank you before we go to the general questions and the summary. Back to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. Yes, thank you again so much. I don't think that I can say anything more than what has been said. Um, I do want to just um, throw out there that as a faith-based leader, you know, the Bible says that people perish for lack of knowledge. And what we are doing right now is giving the knowledge that is necessary and that is very much needed. I do want to ask that those health professionals who are here, uh, and Dr. Mulligan, thank you so very much, but I do want us to be aware and cognizant and sensitive to many of the reasons, not just again historical, but current. Uh, many of the things that, that, uh, that we've heard lately or that I've heard and, and I did not have a rebuttal to was that our communities have inadequate health care on an ongoing basis. And the fact that our communities have inadequate health care on an ongoing basis, and now you're asking for clinical trials to come into our communities for a period of time, it, it seems a bit of a stretch. And so as, as you are communicating with people of uh, black and brown people, I want you to keep those things in mind. And when you're talking with your other healthcare professionals uh, at, the, at the upper levels, please make sure that, that you are advocating for healthcare in our communities on a consistent basis, on a consistent basis. Because if, if, if there is no consistency and, 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 and there's no persistence in this consistency, then when you come out of the blue asking people to do something and to be a part of something, uh, it often does not have as much weight. And so I thank you for the information. Uh, it's great information, but please, please, we need consistency and we need people in our communities looking after our people on a regular basis so that they can survive. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Reverend Jenkins. And Reverend Jenkins said it again, uh, you know, you have to be credible messengers. She said it in, in an eloquent, a more eloquent way. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to, it's, it's, it's three minutes after eight. I'm going to go through some of the questions that you as attendees uh, posed on, on the chat. Uh, and, and we'll pose that to the panelists. Um, I'll just ask, you know, the panelists to give uh, Dr. Mulligan a chance. But if you feel like uh, this is your area, your subject matter expertise, please feel free to jump in and, and we'll recognize you as well. Uh, I think we did get to the questions that, uh, Assembly member Inez Dickens posed. So I'll go on to the next one is Stephen from New York City. Uh, how do I choose between the different trials being offered in New York City? There's, there's apparently there's a number of trials from different organizations and different research institutions. How does a person decide uh, which one is, is to choose from? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. That's a great question. We do, we, we're lucky in the sense that we have multiple institutions participating. Cornell, Columbia, New York Blood Center, 
NYU, um, and, and actually several others, and I won't try and name them all. What I think part of the answer is convenience, you know, wh which ones are in your area and, and easy for you to get to. Many of the institutions are using, you know, either one vaccine or another. There are a couple of different vaccines that are uh, on, in trials right now in the area. Some of them are still enrolling. Others are, have nearly completed enrollment. Um, there, there's actually a fair amount of demand uh, to be in the trials. And uh, I would recommend, you know, personal convenience because uh, you want it to be something that will fit in with your life. And, 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 you know, when you go there or if you talk to them uh, on the phone, if you're comfortable, I think that's important. You, you feel a sense of trust for them. Um, the, the, all the vaccines, I think, need clinical trial participants. They're, you know, they're all roughly uh, the same as far as we know at this point. So I don't think that there's a lot of picking and choosing there. Um, there are technical differences, but I don't think we'll get into those right now. Thank you, Dr. Marvin. Anyone else want to respond? So the next question, I have two people that ask similar questions, so I'll just oppose it as, as one. Uh, but uh, someone in, in Reverend Jenkins' uh, pool, uh, an aerospace forensic expert, no name was given, uh, asked about uh, whether it is too early to test on humans uh, and, and suggesting, uh, really asking whether these, uh, this particular virus uh, or the viruses, the many viruses that are being tried uh, were tested on monkeys and other animals. And then the similar question was uh, by the Diwania Kyles, uh, since viruses are constantly mutating, how is it that a vaccine can stop COVID when it is not the same? I, I assume uh, it wasn't written that way, but I, I'll, I'll take the liberty. When it's not the same as it was in February, March, and, and June uh, because of the mutations, and has the vaccine been tested on animals? Uh, and, and the third part of the question is how many white people have been uh, given the vaccine uh, in this part of the trial and what are the adverse uh, reactions? Oh, they posted an article about adverse reactions. Uh, so that's the stream okay. of question. And uh, sure. I'd like to, can I just add a little piece to that in another question, which is related. They want, someone wants to know, uh, would you do it on your own children? Um, and that's to and, Dr. And, and, and children and elderly. I and elderly, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I love these questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, several of the vaccines were tested on animals before they went into humans. Some of them, the FDA has permitted the animal and human to be in, in uh, at the same time, but that would be a case where there was a lot of experience with the vaccine for something else like flu or uh, Zika in the past, the particular platform. Um, for example, the AstraZeneca trial that we're doing right now at NYU um, there were a number of studies done in animals where they showed protection of, of monkeys uh, against uh, pulmonary disease, for example, with COVID. So um, yes, they all are being tested in animals, sometimes beforehand and sometimes at the same time if the FDA feels that's safe and reasonable. Mutation is not as high as uh, HIV. It's not as high as some of the other viruses in this general category. Uh, virus. Some viruses are more prone to mutation. This one's kind of in the middle. So far, we're not seeing more than one type of the virus. We, again, being humble, that may change as we get further into this pandemic. But right now, um, that doesn't appear to be uh, the case. Uh, the goal of these trials in phase three, stated by uh, the government, is to enroll roughly 25 to 40 percent older adults to have at least uh, in the range of um, uh, close to 50% minority participation. Uh, so far, the trials are, uh, I think, struggling to do that for all the reasons we've talked about tonight uh, and other reasons. Um, they need to do a little better, but over 60% of participants in the trials have been Caucasian, sometimes higher. Um, we, we need to do better and, and uh, do all the things that you all are saying. And, and, and the last part was, um, yeah, I do have a pretty good answer for this one. Um, I have two children. Um, I myself have been a clinical trial participant and, and my daughter uh, has been a clinical trial participant. Now I'm not talking about this COVID, but this was for other, uh, other clinical research, clinical trials. 
So I've had family participate in clinical trials and I've been a trial participant myself. I have an 87 year old mother out in Colorado. She lives in assisted living. And boy, if I could get her the vaccine or a vaccine trial, I would do it in a heartbeat. She's in a small town there where it's not really available. Uh, so I, I would ask, I, I would um, uh, um, approve of my family members if they were wanting to participate, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. I would like to quickly add to that too. I have a bunch of family members, probably about 10 right now, and it's a conflict of interest, so they're not allowed to enroll in our clinical trials. And we've done two with Dr. Mulligan so far, and they've uh, signed up for the CoVPN uh, registry to see if they can be put in a, another clinical trial, maybe Moderna or somewhere else. Um, but I, I would do it myself if I could do it, and uh, I would recommend it to any of my family members who wanted to join. Thank you, Maria, for sharing that. I would say I've also had family members and friends ask me about it, and it kind of made me glad that they've been listening to me all these years of <laughs> now being really interested in research. And I've also had family members ask me to help them find clinical trials for other health conditions that they have, uh, including Parkinson's and type 2 diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Langford. Dr. Uh, Pug, can I ask a question of Dr. Mulligan based upon what he just said? Sure. Yeah, you mentioned that 60% of the individuals uh, who are in the clinical trials are white. My question is, I know that there, you mentioned that there are different manufacturers of the vaccine, people that are uh, working. We know we've heard about the, the race to get the vaccine done. My question is, are there different, how should I say, different, I don't know the technical medical term, formulas, different vaccines uh, that each manufacturer is doing or creating and so to, uh, is everyone getting the same vaccine trial? That's what I, I'm trying to say. I don't know the correct yeah. medical language, but is it, are, are they getting the same vaccine during this trial right. that this community is getting, that the yeah. next community is getting? Right. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, you, you ask great questions and I love them. Uh, and, and I know you're also um, providing questions from your, your constituency, but... Um, yeah, the, the, there are four different phase three trials going on in the US right now. Um, and they're all reaching out to all the same communities. They all are in fact rec being required by FDA to be sure to enroll at least this many older adults and to be sure that they must have um, uh, minority participation. The US government, which is funding the trials, so your tax dollars, my tax dollars, paying for these things, and therefore they are insisting to the manufacturers that you've got to have enough minority representation in these trials. And I know for a fact that some of the trials that were lagging behind on minority participation, they, they slowed them down and said, wait a minute, we just can't fill this up with white people. You've got to have more participation from those who have been most affected. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I formulated my question correctly. The different, each, each manufacturer that is making or creating the vaccine, are those different vaccines? I mean, I know the end yes. result, of course, is to, are they different vaccines, different formulations, and are those different formulations going to different communities? So for instance, if Pfizer okay. has vaccination ABC, is it going to Harlem? If Merck has a vaccination XYZ formulated, yeah. all with the same intention, is that going to Los Angeles? That's the question. Yeah, no, you, you formulated it correctly. I just didn't answer it well. Um, I thought that's what you meant, and I didn't quite get to that. The answer is yes, they actually are different technical platforms, if you will. One is an RNA vaccine, one is a, a weakened common cold virus that can't multiply in the body, but can provide, uh, potentially provide the vaccine protection. So there are different platforms. Some of them are just like flu shots, a little bit of protein. So they are different, yes, and they are going across the board to all communities. Nobody is targeting to just one area or another. For example, each of these trials is enrolling at least 30,000 participants. Four times 30 is 
you know, really it's 150,000 or more people needed if you add it all up. And they're not just US, they're also in Brazil, they're in South Africa, they're in UK. Um, but most, most of the trial research is going on in the US. Uh, and uh, it's, although they're different technical platforms, they're different, it's kind of like, you know, one's a pickup truck and one's a sports car and one is a sedan, you know, they're not the same thing, they're all vaccines or cars, but they're gonna do it a little bit differently, each one, um, but they're all being offered across the board equally. So Dr. Mullen, what is the distribution for this trial that NYU is, is uh, yeah. in stage so three the, for? Yeah, the, 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 uh, Ast responsible for. Right. the AstraZeneca trial um, is the one that we're currently participating in. And they have the same kind of uh, uh, distribution goal for representation in the trial. We're looking for 25 to 40% older adults. We're looking for in the range of, um, uh, I'd say 40% combined African-American and Hispanic. Um, we're looking for chronic conditions, but those are the rough percentages. They're not exactly that way, and it's not written down in the protocol itself, but it's what we're talking about, what we're hearing should be our enrollment goals. Very significant participation of those who have been most heavily infected, uh, affected by this virus. Older adults, minority communities, chronic conditions, and then of course we want the frontline workers uh, to be participating as well. Healthy people who are middle-aged are not, uh, you know, particularly white healthy people who are middle-aged, they're not likely to be able to get into one of these trials right now, the phase three, because they're not at the highest risk. Uh, you mentioned AstraZeneca as a sponsor for this particular trial. Uh, one, of our, one of our attendees uh, wrote in the chat a question uh, around uh, the pause, or, uh, I think, she pulled an article, and, and we are aware of an article that AstraZeneca paused this study uh, because of a, a reaction in the United Kingdom. Could you talk about that and what that means and in, in, in the procedure sure. behind the pause? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. That, that's actually an important one that I was pretty certain we would get to tonight. The um, uh, clinical trials are written so that if there's an unexpected illness in a phase three trial that is something that you know you weren't really thinking would be a known side effect of a vaccine, something that goes beyond the sort of sore arm, body aches, maybe a little fever, the things I said that it might be a little bothersome for a day or two, but it's probably a good thing. It's, the vaccine is doing its job. This would be something unexpected that would be more significant. And they had such an occurrence in a participant uh, in and not in our trial, but in a, a related trial using the same vaccine in uh, England, in the UK. And so across the world, all of the trials using that vaccine, what's now the AstraZeneca vaccine, were put on hold. This is a normal part of clinical research. I've seen this many times in my 30 plus years. Uh, we, the protocols are written so that if an unexpected illness occurs, in order not to harm anyone else in case it is from the vaccine, we put things on hold and then we try to figure it out. Is this related to the vaccine? One of the key things is that life events continue to happen to people even when they're in clinical trials. I can go out and sprain my ankle or uh, get in a car wreck while I'm in a clinical trial, but that doesn't mean the vaccine caused that. So what, what's being done is the FDA and the safety monitoring board in the United States are very carefully reviewing this. I think it's a good thing that it's on pause. Uh, it's a little frustrating because we were all geared up to, to, you know, to do the trial, um, but it's the right thing because we, we put safety first. It's, it's showing us that we're not cutting corners on safety, even though, and I know Scott doesn't like this word, you know, even though some people are talking about Operation Warp Speed, the speed is not coming from cutting corners on safety. And this is a good example of the safety apparatus is at work. We've been on pause for over three weeks now waiting to get going. And one last point, if I may, Malcolm, in the UK and in Brazil and in South Africa, they have resumed their trials. Their ethics panels and their FDA equivalents finished their review, decided it is safe and reasonable to proceed and that we're going to do that. The United States, we're still waiting. I personally believe they will resume the trial and, and uh, most likely pretty soon. But I'm glad they're collecting lots of data and being very careful with safety of our participants. 
Thank you, Dr. Mullen. The same particip the same attendee, uh, the the wanna uh, posted in the chat uh, a comment from Dr. Xavier Simons, a a research fellow at Australian Catholic University, uh, who described, I guess, the statement from the AstraZeneca folks uh, in relation to the pause. Uh, that the purpose, the reason for the pause was uh, because of a, a serious adverse event. And she's really asking uh, how serious of an adverse event was it? And was there any other cases of adverse events related to the pause? Yeah, so in the AstraZeneca trial, that, there's a lot that's been published in the New York Times and other newspapers. There's also uh, what's being told to the investigators as part of the confidential information we get. I'll be very honest, what's in the newspapers is a lot more than what I've been told. What we know is that there's been a, you know, a, an unexpected illness. It's been reported in the newspapers, so I'm not revealing anything I'm not supposed to that I'm gonna get in trouble for as a transverse myelitis. Uh, this is a spinal cord uh, condition. It ca can cause weakness in the arms or legs. It often occurs after a viral illness. And so one of the questions is, well, did the vaccine cause it? Or is this coincidental that this individual had a virus and then had transverse myelitis, if that's in fact what it is? They're still going through all the evaluation in the US. Um, the, uh, the newspapers have, uh, I don't think, reported any other cases. And I can't really comment on that uh, further right now. But um, it is an event that is um, of concern and that is being looked at very carefully and that they're gonna be sorted out and the right decision will be made for the safety of participants. And keeping in mind that um, many things happen during the conduct of a trial and they're not always all due to the vaccine itself. And, and you know, one time can happen, two times of coincidence out of 30,000 participants might be, but if you start to see three or four, then that is telling you that there might be something going on and we're not in that situation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mulligan. Another theme that arose was uh, several participants are asking who are the funders for this trial uh, and, and where the money is coming from. Yeah. Well, the funders are uh, Dr. Punter, uh, no, Dr. No, Dawson. No, it's the no. U.S. It's the U. Yes, it's the U. Absolutely. Your tax dollars. So yes, it's Dr. Langford. We're we're the ones that are funding this. It pays for the clinical research. And again, none of us involved in running the trials are getting any personal funds of any kind. This is our, you know, our um, life's work. Uh, this is our, our, our mission in life is to, you know, help humanity through vaccine research. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rico Cox, who is a licensed uh, master social worker at HCCI uh, and, and, and heads up one of our uh, clinical programs, if you will, he works with the HIV and AIDS uh, housing program and supervises a team of uh, caseworkers and social workers that uh, provide services to those, those uh, folks in our residency. Mr. Cox had a question. Mr. Cox? Yes, actually, I wanted to say I'm glad to be a member of this uh, community advisory board. Um, I find Dr. Mulligan being an individual of uh, earnestness and in integrity. And I'm glad that the organization that I'm a part of is able to like uh, parlay our trust that we have in the community and the respect that we have in the community to be part of this effort. But the, uh, the question I wanted to ask of Dr. Mulligan is uh, please describe how the, how the drug in our trial works. Uh, I know it works on the cellular level. I know other drugs are yeah. working on different levels. And I think that would help people to understand even better. Uh, you make the comment that uh, you cannot get COVID from uh, the vaccine. And part of the reason for that is. <laughs> it doesn't, it con yeah, absolutely. I'll finish your sentence. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Sure. And thanks for your service on the community advisory board. We, you cannot get COVID from the vaccine was where he left off and I'll finish because the the vaccine doesn't contain the whole virus. One way I like to say it is, if my hand was the whole virus, uh, what we're doing with the vaccine is just showing, let's say a pinky, just, just 
giving that part to the immune system in the body to make its response to. So it's never the whole thing. Um, to go back to his first question, how does it work? There are two general kinds of vaccines that are being tested currently. One is what we call genetic immunization. Those are the RNA vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and the um, recombinant vector vaccines like AstraZeneca and, and also Johnson & Johnson, which started its trial last week. Those are weakened common cold viruses. They can't cause the common cold. They can't multiply in the body. But what they all do, RNA or DNA or the weakened common cold viruses, they prevent, present a message. They get injected into your arm and the deltoid muscle, and they message the cells to produce a protein. And that protein then triggers the antibodies and B cells and T cells, the immune response. With the more standard protein vaccines, you're not giving the message to then make the protein in the body, but you're actually just giving the protein. It's a little bit simpler. That's like the flu shot. We all get the protein goes right into the body. And those are often given, Mr. Cox, with an adjuvant, which is something to help enhance the immune response. So these are the main types of vaccines that are currently being tested uh, in, for uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mulligan. So we're at the five minute point uh, remaining for, for our session this evening. Uh, if anybody has any remaining questions, please quickly post them. We'll try to answer them this evening. If we can't answer them this evening, uh, we'll, uh, this, this session is being recorded and we'll make every effort to answer them post uh, uh, post the forum this evening. Uh, I will turn over the session back to Dr. Dawson, uh, Joan Dawson, uh, the chair met, chairperson of the uh, Harlem Congregations for Community Impro Improvement. And uh, I really would like to thank you, Dr. Mulligan and your team, uh, Dr. Dr. Langford, Dr. S uh, uh, Ratzan, uh, Juanita, you've been you know, uh, such a, a, a great person to work with on this project. Um, and Reverend, Reverend Jenkins, uh, Deacon Beckford, and Dr. Lewis, who's, who's actually uh, one of my mentors. He's my dissertation uh, committee member. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, and certainly uh, Michelle Sweeting, who's, who's been a friend of mine for, for, for all our lives, uh, and Dr. Dawson, who uh, was my executive mentor for my dissertation. Uh, so thank you all for being here. And uh, Dr. Dawson, please. Uh, your, your closing uh, remarks. Uh, Dr. Dawson, please re take yourself off the mute, please. Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just ditto ex everything that you've just said. I won't repeat uh, all of the people you thanked, but I too thank you for being a part of this. I also want to thank the over a hundred people who participated um, from the audience, uh, the people who are in tune and stayed in tune for the entire two hours. Uh, I think that's a great testament to many of the uh, concerns some of the panelists have, uh, have expressed in terms of how do we get information out to the communities. Well, I think that's a testament to the need and the interest that's out there. Uh, I've been reading some of the comments and I, the comments are like excellent, um, session, uh, information, great job. So uh, I'd like to thank all of those people who participated and, uh, I, I'd, and I'd like to just say that we will be doing other things. ACCI, ACCI is always doing things and now that we have a partnership, I've always had a partnership with NYU, but now that we have a partnership with Langon that's even closer, we will certainly pro probably be doing other things. Uh, Again, Michelle, um, honorable sweeting, I, Michelle to me, um, who has, is like a daughter and uh, her mom, who I know very well. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, I want to just- I'm yeah. sorry, before you end, we, we had uh, one attendee who brought to my attention, we did not address her question. Uh, who is that? Ms. Gonzalez, uh, she wants to know about any long-term effects of the vaccine. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Right now, what's published, if you go and look at the literature, the studies are just two months after vaccination. We're, we're giving the short-term safety 
and immune response. Um, some trial participants have now been followed for as long as, you see, we vaccinated our first participant on May 4th. So now that's almost five months, but um, the data are still coming in. So I, unfortunately, this won't be very satisfying, I apologize, but we don't know the long-term uh, effects because we haven't had the long-term happen yet with these vaccines. We're currently out about five months right now uh, with these vaccines. And um, each of the, tri this is important, each of the trials will last two years so that we follow people for safety uh, for out to two years to be sure that there aren't any unexpected or unanticipated uh, late ill effects. And if I could sneak in my last word, it would just be this. Um, I have learned so much, thank you. And I appreciate this uh, very much, Dr. Punter, Dr. Dawson, all the panelists. I wanna thank you and all the questions from the audience. And, and my last comment is something I learned from Walt Orenstein, a great vaccinologist, used to head the CDC vaccine program. And he says, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations save lives. So what I'm hoping is that as a group, we can move from vaccine to vaccination. A vaccine on the shelf won't save anybody. We've, we've got to get them into arms if, you know, once we know they're safe and effective. And, that, and that's the tricky part. Once it's licensed, will people take it? Scott has spoken eloquently about the challenges of that. Thank you. Yeah, I want, before we close, and we're right at closing time, which in fact it is 8.30, but there is one source for additional information I'd like to uh, read off to you. Um, it's coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org slash clinical studies FAQ. FAQ. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you again, everybody, and have a good evening. And uh, uh, we sent a survey. Uh, please fill out the survey. Take the time. It's, I think it's five to seven questions. Uh, we'd like to know your thoughts. It's uh, the link has been sent to all uh, attendees and panelists. Thank you. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.